A couple announcements that did not make it into your bulletin that we want to give this morning. Uh, I trust that everybody, attenders and members, received an email from the board this past week. And I have another one here that I'm going to read to you. But first, I want to give a little bit of a personal view. This is not re necessarily representing the board. It's representing, I think, to a certain extent, but it's my thoughts. When this COVID started, I, as a board member, I thought, how do, how do I feel on this? Where do I stand? And I struggled with that tremendously. Give it a lot of thought and a lot of prayer. And I come to the conclusion that it didn't make any difference how I thought. It's what does God think. And he did not leave us blank in that area. If we go back to scriptures, we can find what God thinks and how the church should be run. And I think if we as a board or as membership start running the church on our feelings, we can get on shaky ground pretty fast because we're all sinners saved by grace. And so I think for us, that was what we thought, uh, at least for me, and I don't thought as a board, is we made decisions is how do we glorify God? We come to church, and our ultimate goal should be to glorify God. I trust and pray that we all get something out of the service. We should. But our first priority should be to glorify and worship God in this house. So with that, the board has put together another statement I would like to read to you at this time. COVID-19 has affected everyone across the world in unique and unexpected ways. And this church has brought out an issues that prior to this pandemic, we would never expected within this assembly. Decisions have had to be made by the board that should never have to been contemplated under nor normal circumstances. We are no longer under what we recognize as normal, and we believe that a new normal may have to be realized. The church has been imposed upon by the state in many ways because of this virus. In Matthew 22, starting in verses 15, the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus as to where tribute should be paid. Jesus asked them to look at the coin and tell him whose image was, was seen. He then said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. In the decisions that we as a board have made, that has been, that is what we have tried to do. We understand that, the gov that we have a government that God has allowed to be established. And even though we may not agree with those in charge, we must, to a degree, follow the laws with which we disagree, thus rendering to Caesar. We would never intentionally render unto Caesar what is God's. It would be in those instances where we would take a stand against civil authority and disobey mandates. It is God to whom we answer as a board, and while we hope that the decisions that we made will be agreed with by everyone, unfortunately, this is not possible. In these cases, we hope that whatever our decision, whether our decision was correct or not in your eyes, we hope that you understand our decision is intended to please God our Father and the following in following his word and wise counsel of those who have gone before us. The disagreements within this church can do one of two things. They can either divide us or they can make us stronger as a body. We ask that you pray as to how you can be a tool that God can be used to mend wounds and encourage this body to work towards restoration. Thank you, CBC Board. Today we're planning to finish up chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, and here we're going to be talking about the rapture. And these are some pretty deep waters. We're going to dive into a lot more technical detail than normal, uh, but in the end I'm going to try to bring it back and make it applicable, um, and we'll see how that goes. 
Uh, but to start out our study here of 1 Thessalonians 4, the last part of 1 Thessalonians 4, I want us to first go back to our study of the book of Jude that we went through a few months ago and talk about some of the highlights because these things tie directly together, I think. If you remember back when we worked through this book, we said that the whole theme of the book, the whole point, the thrust of where Jude was going with this could be found in verse 3. And that's where Jude had said, you've got all of these things going on in the church and in the world. He said, contend for the faith. That was the point of the book of Jude, right? To contend for the faith. And then Jude goes on to cover some other topics. He talks about false teachers. He talked about a call to persevere. And there were some other things. And then in verses 17 to 20, part of which uh, Merv read here at the beginning of, surf, at the, beginning of the service, At the end of the book there, in these verses, Paul comes back to this concept introduced in verse 3, contending for the faith, and he tells us in those verses how it is that we do that. And he gave us four different things that we needed to do to contend for the faith. And if you remember back when we worked through that study, the first one was, he said, build yourself up in the faith. And as we worked through that, we said that means read your Bible, study the Bible, get to know the Bible. That's how you build yourself up in the faith. Second, he said, pray in the Holy Spirit. We spent a fair amount of time talking about that too, and that was not speaking in tongues or anything like that. We, we worked through biblically how he was talking about the need to pray with the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about fervent, earnest prayers that are within God's will. Read the Bible, study the Bible, pray. And the third thing he said was keep yourself in God's love. And again, when we work through that as well, we noted that this wasn't a call to maintain your salvation. What he was saying echoed back to a quote from John chapter 15, verses 9 to 10, which says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. And so we worked through all of that and we looked at some other passages. We saw that the Bible tells us we show our love to God through obedience. And so we put this together and we see Jude says, Read the Bible and pray, but don't just read the Bible and pray. We have to read the Bible, we have to pray, and we have to live the life. Well, those are the three things Jude says that we're supposed to be doing now. And then we got to that fourth thing at the end, and we said that was kind of the glue that holds everything together, because these first three things are hard work. For us, these are not things that come naturally to us as people, but the fourth one was inspiration. Jude says the fourth thing to do, keep your eye on the prize. Remember that? Jude said Jesus is coming back for us and the absolute certainty of this promise. This is what will keep us going. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 to 18 that we read, Paul's talking about the rapture. Or we're going to read. Uh, Paul's talking about the rapture and uh, there is just nothing more encouraging or motivating for us as Christians than looking forward to Jesus coming back for us and taking us away from everything in this big mess that's around us. So given that introduction, let's go ahead and we'll jump to our passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to read to you verses 13 to 18. He says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that, you do not, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep." For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 
So here we have, at the end of chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians, this incredible description of something to come. This is this amazing description of the rapture. And Paul is talking about this to address a problem that was happening in the Thessalonian church. The, The problem at hand was this. This is the first generation of believers, right? The church just gets established, first generation, first group of believers, They're introduced to this concept of the rapture by Paul. They're excited about it. They're looking forward to the return of Jesus, Jesus coming back from them. And while they're waiting for this thing to happen, some of the other new believers pass away and they die. Right? And so the folks who are left are, are thinking about those people that they've lost and they start to get worried. If the next step is Jesus coming back for his church, what about the church members who've died? What about them? Do they get left behind? And so Paul writes this to them to say, no, don't worry. Nobody's getting left behind. Those brothers and sisters of yours that have passed away, they're actually going to be first when Jesus comes back. So it was this incredibly encouraging uh, note to the the Thessalonians to straighten out a unique problem of where they were in history and kind of understand why they were thinking that or why they be concerned about that. For us, we don't really have this problem so much, it being 2020. We have generation after generation of, uh, of ancestors who knew the Lord and have passed away, and we as a people have gotten very comfortable with this concept because of passages like this. But just for us now in 2020, this isn't the struggle. But we do have a different struggle today where these words really help us out. Because while the words of the rapture were so real for that church back then, for us, there has been so much information about this topic saying it doesn't exist, or it does exist, or disagreement about when it's going to happen, and it's kind of difficult to understand when you just read through some of it. And so for many of us today, the concept of the rapture as a real thing, as a promise to look forward to, is a difficult thing. All right, so for us, this is applicable because we can read this and, uh, and this can be a blessing for us because it can help us to better understand this amazing promise that God has given us. And so in the time that we have left, I want to work through that. And again, I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you more than usual. Uh, I'm going to do things a little bit different here, but I, I really want to make this biblical promise be very evident as a real thing. So to start talking about the rapture and all the concerns around it or trying to straighten uh, uh, this concept out, we need to start with a larger topic or larger concept called the day of the Lord. This can be tricky too. The day of the Lord we find all throughout or, or in many different places in our Bible, we have to understand when the Bible talks about the day of the Lord, it's not talking about a single 24 hour day. This is not a a specific day on the calendar. Instead, this is a long period of time, and a lot of different things happen during this period of time. So when you're reading your Bible and you come across the day of the Lord, you have to look at the context of what's around that to know which part of the day your passage is dealing with. So we're going to map this out here. This is our timeline. And so if we were to plot on the timeline where we're at... We're at the beginning of this snapshot of the timeline. Obviously, a lot has happened up until now, but right now we are in what is called the church age. This started in Acts chapter 2. It's been going on ever since. We're still in the church age today. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 21, way at the other end of this timeline, in Revelation 21, God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And this is the last of the future things that we can see in the Bible. So we've got where we're at now, we have this very distant thing, and in between these two events on our timeline, that's what is called the day of the Lord. And like we said, there's a lot of things going on here in the day of the Lord. And um, among them, we'll just go through a few, of these, a few of these concepts here. It's not all of them. But among them is the tribulation. We have the second coming of Christ. And there's the battle of Armageddon, or what some people call the apocalypse, right? That's right after that. Then we have the millennial kingdom, thousand-year reign of Christ. And then we have the great white throne judgment. So we got to recognize the Bible talks about two different judgments in, in the end times. The great white throne judgment for unbelievers, 
The judgment of believers is a separate event. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So all of these things together, everything in the orange, all of these things are what make up uh, the day of the Lord. So here's where we're at. These orange things in the new heaven and the new earth is what the Bible says is going to be happening next. And so the two big questions when we look at all of this are, One, when do we make the transition from the church age to the day of the Lord? That's a question on everybody's mind. And two, where is the church during the day of the Lord as well? We're going to address the concept of timing uh, here in a little bit, but we'll start with uh, where is the church during the day of the Lord, and we'll kind of work backwards, right? Um, So we're starting, right, we're here, let's see if I can go here, we're here right now. We know the new heaven and new earth, we're going to be there. If we work through the day of the Lord, we're not at the great white throne judgment if we've made Jesus our Savior. During the millennial kingdom, the Bible says we're going to be with Christ and we're going to have jobs. We're coming back with Jesus in the second coming. And so the question is, where is the church during the tribulation? And this part is... Uh, pretty hotly debated, and there's all kinds of different ideas about this. And this morning, I'm going to plead the case with you that the church is raptured before the tribulation begins. So in other words, when the church age concludes, everybody who knows Jesus uh, as their Savior, excuse me, when uh, when the church age concludes, everybody who knows Jesus as their Savior will experience what we just read in 1 Thessalonians 4. We get snatched up from the earth Uh, We're going to be collected with Jesus or with our fellow believers and going up to heaven until the second coming when we're coming back down with him. So we're going to work through this concept and timing of a pre-tribulation rapture, and I think you'll see that it's really not all that difficult to see or grasp this. It's believed that this is a very hard concept, but I think as long as we're looking at the scriptures in their most natural form and not trying to read other church doctrine into them, I I hope we'll come down uh, at the end of this discussion that we're all on the same page with this and that it's, it's pretty clear what the Bible's getting at. And so we'll start out our discussion here looking at a verse that we talked about last week, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And this was that note to the church in Philadelphia, if you remember we worked through that. It said, since you have kept my commands to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth to test the inhabitants of the earth. So this passage is a a classic proof text on the pre-tribulation rapture. It's written to the church in Philadelphia, but for this section of Revelation, it's a message to seven churches, and for a whole host of reasons we don't have time to get into now, it's widely believed that these churches are representative of all churches of all times. And so the thought is, if we resemble the church in Philadelphia, keeping God's commands and waiting patiently, then God is going to keep us from this big trial, the the tribulation that is yet to come. And the Greek here is very specific in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's not that we'll be protected from the trial. Uh, It's not that we're going to be taken out in the middle of it. It says He's going to keep us from it. So we've got this idea of a rapture addressed in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And again, this is a, a controversial doctrine. Churches come down on different Uh, different sides of this. Uh, And some churches, many denominations say there's really no rapture at all. They say that's just not even in the Bible at all. They say it's a made-up concept. And the classic point of denial here is that the word rapture is not even in the Bible, right? Word rapture doesn't appear in there. And the classic response to this is, well, neither is the word trinity. That word doesn't appear in the Bible either, and very clearly the Bible paints a picture of a a triune God. The trinity is a very real thing, even though the Bible doesn't use that particular word. However, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I've done a lot of research on this, and I have not found any scholar who has said this. This is just strictly my thing. I could be off base, but uh, when I read through this, I see the rapture plain as day in the Bible. If we remember, this book was written in Koine Greek, okay? the original scriptures, New Testament in Greek, we read them in English. But for many years, we've got to remember Bible scholarship in Latin. 
You've probably heard of the Latin Vulgate. This is a very old translation of the Bible. It was in Latin, and for a long time, that's what the church preached from. You'd come to church, you'd hear a sermon uh, delivered in Latin, you'd hear uh, the Bible quoted in Latin. This is what scholars studied. This was the language that scholars used. And so the word rapture came from the Latin word rapio, which means to snatch or to seize. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 that we read this morning, our passage from today. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Caught up, what we read in English, that's translated from the Greek word harpazo, which means, guess what, to snatch, to seize, or to take away. In other words, Greek harpazo was translated as rapio in the Latin. So this word rapture that doesn't appear in our Bibles is just the literal Latin translation of the very thing we're reading in 1 Thessalonians 4. So I would say, plain as day, here's your rapture right here in the Bible. This is written out very specifically. That's how it appears to me. And while there's some people who, who, who try to say this rapture isn't its own event at all, some people will say, well, the second coming and all these verses that we ascribe to the rapture, really it's just the same event. Uh, that's a pretty, a pretty, common, uh, pretty common stance. Um, I, I think that uh, that just does not work biblically. I want to just take a quick moment here and go through some of these events. I know we all come from different backgrounds, right? So in case you are not convinced that the Bible talks about the rapture as being clearly a separate event from the second coming, I want to line up the two events and just go through some differences. And my intent here isn't to dive into any depth on any of these, just to uh, paint the picture that we're talking about two different things. In John 14 and 1 Thessalonians 4, we see a picture of the rapture with Jesus for his church. He's coming to get us. Colossians 3, Zechariah 14, Jude 14, and Revelation 19, Jesus comes back at the second coming with his church. Same people involved, different interaction. 1 Thessalonians 4, we meet Jesus in the air. That's what happens at the rapture, but in the second coming, Zechariah 14, Revelation 19, show Jesus' feet touching the ground. He comes all the way back to the earth at the second coming. John 14, 3, at the rapture, says Jesus takes us up to heaven. But in the second coming, Zechariah 14, Revelation 19, Jesus brings us back to earth. Totally different events going on here. 1 Corinthians 15 describes the rapture as being too quick to observe. Happens in the blink of an eye. The rapture, all of a sudden it takes place. But the second coming, uh, Zechariah 12, Matthew 24, Revelation 1, says it happens slowly. You can see Jesus coming back during the second coming. Angels not sent to gather people up during the, uh, during the rapture, and I think that just makes sense. The resurrected Christians and the rest of the church age saints are probably going to be willing to cooperate in the rapture, right? Angels don't need to be deployed to gather people up. But uh, Matthew 13, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, 2 Thessalonians 1 clearly show angels gathering up people for judgment at the second coming. No mention of Jesus coming on a white horse during the rapture. Revelation 19, Jesus comes back in the second coming on a white horse. 1 Thessalonians 4, Titus 2, 1 John 3, the message of the rapture is about hope and it's about comfort, but the second coming, Joel, 13, Joel 3, Revelation 19, and Malachi 4, it's a message of judgment. And look, there's a lot more things we could be adding to our list here. I just cherry-picked a few. There's different participants with some of it. There's different locations. There's all kinds of different things. Uh, but I just wanted to put enough up here to just make it evident that the Bible talks about two distinctly different events. Right? There is the rapture. There is the second coming. There's some overlap with, the, uh, with some involvement, but these are two distinct things. So if we go back to our timeline... We know that 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us that the rapture is going to be one of the events of the day of the Lord, so we know it has to happen at some point in the orange part, but the question is when, All right? 
Revelation 19, we know we're coming back with Jesus in the second coming, so it, it can't happen during the millennial kingdom or after. This, happens to be, this has to be something that happens either some point around or during the tribulation. And like I said, we're going to argue uh, here this morning that it's going to be before the tribulation. There's plenty of other churches who say uh, there's a, there is a rapture, but it's going to be at the end or at the middle, and maybe we'll all be in heaven together uh, laughing at who was right and who was wrong. But um, I think we can biblically make a good, a good educated guess on this. So let's take a look at this. I want to look at the, uh, the end tribulation and middle tribulation first and talk about why these are unsatisfying answers. And then we'll make the case for the pre-tribulation rapture, and then we'll talk about the hope that that particular thing gives us. So first, we've already established the tribulation and second coming are two different events, but some people say the day of the Lord doesn't start until after the tribulation. And so the idea here is, yeah, they're separate events, but Jesus starts out his second coming, coming down from heaven, and then we go up and meet him in the air and kind of turn around and... Uh, finish uh, coming back to the earth with him. All right, so say this is something that happens right at the end of the tribulation, um, and um, yeah, so it happens at the end, but it still, but it still actually happens. And this doesn't really work linguistically. We don't need to get into the Greek here. I may be the only person who actually cares about that. But the idea is that if we were to go up and meet him in the air and then turn around, uh, Paul probably would have used some different words to describe it than what he did. But also, if we were to go up and meet him, like kind of halfway and come back with him, this makes John 14, verses 2 and 3 problematic. John 14, 2 to 3, one of the best promises in the Bible, says, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. What a great promise, right? It's one of those things that that we should be looking forward to that should be motivating us. And so here, Jesus said he's going to come back and he's going to take us to be with him in a place that he has prepared for us in heaven. It says that plain as day, right? So if we think back through to our timeline again, and I won't put it up on the screen, but he can't be talking about the new heavens and the earth, because if he said he's going to prepare a place, the new heavens and new earth, that's a construction project that hasn't started yet. That's not going to uh, start until after the millennial kingdom. So he can't be talking about that. And we know that he can't be talking about the millennial kingdom either because the Bible says we're going to be with him on earth during that time. So he has to be talking about some time either during or before the tribulation because if we go and meet him in the air and turn right back around and come back with him in the second coming, then John 14 verses 2 to 3 never happens. There's some other problems too really struggle with how much to talk about. We only have so much time, right? First is the wedding feast. And the wedding feast is this amazing thing. This probably deserves its own Sunday or, or a couple of Sundays uh, to work through. But the idea here is that the church is the bride of Christ. Revelation 19 verses 7 through 10 shows us the wedding feast taking place in heaven. We're there. It's magnificent. It's an amazing thing. We're a part of that, according to this part of Revelation. And immediately after that, in Revelation 19, we have Jesus returning to the earth, the second coming. And that picture very clearly includes us going with him. So if the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, when does the wedding feast take place? There's no time for it. That doesn't work. We have the same issue with the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to talk more about the judgment seat in a minute. Uh, But the judgment seat of Christ has to take place before the second coming. We're not going to come back with Him clothed in white, fully in our glorified bodies and all that until we go through the judgment. So again, a rapture at the end of the tribulation is problematic because there'd be no time for the judgment seat of Christ or the wedding feast to take place. And there's still one more problem I want to work through with you. And this is a really big one. At the end of the tribulation, the Bible says that all of the non-believing people are wiped out. Difficult thing to to work through, but that's that's the prophecy, right? All the non-believers at the end of the tribulation die. And then 1 Corinthians 15.51 tells us that at the rapture, 
the dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ will all be changed. We're going to be transformed into our glorified bodies. So if these two things are simultaneous, all unbelievers dying and all believers being transformed, then that makes a lot of scripture about the millennial kingdom impossible. Zechariah chapter 8, Isaiah 65, and other verses either directly talk about or imply that regular people, believers in their natural bodies, are going to enter into the millennial kingdom. It has to be that way. Babies get born there. And this doesn't work if the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation because there'd be no normal people in their regular bodies left to enter into the millennial kingdom. There's other things we can go into, but... I hope we've established here in your mind that the rapture is a real thing and it clearly doesn't take place at the end of the millennial kingdom. So what about the middle? There's a number of different flavors of this uh, this particular idea and we really don't have time to flesh this out uh, completely, but one of the, uh, most of these views hinge on dividing up the tribulation into two parts. And they say there's tribulation is made up of man's wrath and God's wrath. And I can kind of see where they get this uh, because the first and the second half of the tribulation are different. You can see clearly a dividing point in Revelation 6 between verses 11 and 12 when the sixth seal is open up. All the judgments and difficulties in the first half are man doing things to other men. In the second half, it's worse, and it's just God's straight judgment with no middleman. And so holders of this position generally say that the first half isn't really part of the tribulation proper, and so the rapture doesn't happen until that midpoint. And uh, God's promise for the church to not go through the great tribulation would be only a promise to not go through that second part. And I kind of get it. But there are some problems with this point, too, because first, I don't think this is the most natural reading of Scripture. In the Bible, God very clearly and regularly uses man to deliver his wrath. That is all over both Testaments. You have governments uh, acting to deliver God's wrath. You have individuals pouring out God's wrath. That is all over the book. So just because we see man suffering at the hand of man, it does not mean that God is not involved. In fact, I think there's enough precedent here to assume that that's God's plan being advanced all along. Second, the first part of Revelation chapter 6 clearly shows this first half coming from God. Jesus himself opens the first seal, and you can see the judgments originating from heaven right there. Here's the first few verses. I'll read this to you. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. So this is the beginning of the tribulation right here. The part that some people call man's wrath or Satan's wrath or or, or whatever, but we can clearly see this part is coming from God. Absent any other presuppositions, I'm really not sure how we break the tribulation in half um, and, and say that this is not God's wrath that we're seeing here because as I read my Bible, this is exactly how I interpret it as coming from God. Additionally, if we schedule the rapture for the middle of the tribulation period, we run into another issue, and it's a big one, and it has to do with the imminency of Christ's return. And that's the idea that Jesus can come back at any time. This is an important doctrine for us to understand, that there is nothing else biblically that needs to take place or needs to happen. No more prophecy needs to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back for us. There is a lot of unfulfilled prophecy left in Scripture, things that are still going to come true, but for Jesus to come back, there is no thing that we need to wait to see fulfilled first. And when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 1, our passage today and some other things, it really looks like Paul and the Thessalonians thought they were going to get raptured too. Right? That was the point of why he was having to write this thing. 
These guys thought that it would be happening in their lifetime. They weren't waiting for some other prophecy to be fulfilled before they started looking for Jesus to come back. I think we talked last week about the issue of Paul having to write to these guys saying, you're so focused on the rapture that some people weren't working anymore. They were just sitting around waiting for it to happen. If they thought they were going to have to go through three and a half years of tribulation first, I think they would be hard at work stockpiling food and 556 five, ammo or whatever it is that people defended themselves with back then. So these people, I think clearly, you look at the scriptures, it seems pretty evident uh, that Paul and the Thessalonians were expecting all of this to be happening in their lifetime. They weren't looking for anything else uh, to be fulfilled. And I figure... If they learned from the very person that God used to write parts of the Bible explaining the rapture, chances are they had a good handle on how it worked and what the timing was. And so clearly, this first generation church was expecting a pre-tribulation rapture, and I think therefore we should too. All right, so make a couple points about this, then I promise I'll wrap it up. So Jesus coming back like a thief in the night works for a pre-tribulation rapture, right? We don't start seeing some of Revelation 6 coming true and realize, oh, we're in the tribulation, the rapture must be coming soon. Jesus coming back, the day of the Lord comes back as a surprise. This huge block of time, I think, kicks off with the rapture, uh, and then we go back up to heaven with Jesus. We experience the judgment seat of Christ We get to enjoy the wedding feast, and then we get to dwell in that place in heaven that Jesus has been preparing for us until the second coming. That's how I see the order of these things playing out. At that point, we come back with him uh, triumphantly. Let me cover two more reasons quickly why the pre-tribulation rapture works timing-wise. And this first one is really cool. Uh, It fits in really well with Revelation 4 that we covered a few weeks ago. We have to make this distinction, as we've already said, between the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ, right? We said the great white throne judgment, this was for people who did not know Jesus as their Savior, but the judgment seat of Christ, different judgment, separate event, this is for people who know Jesus as their Savior. That word that we translate into English as judgment seat, in the Greek, that word is bima, and that's literally a judgment seat, but it's not just a seat for any kind of judgment. This isn't like a, a, a seat in a courtroom or anything like that. The bema was a place where uh, in the ancient Olympic games, a judge of a race would sit. He'd put that bema seat right next to the finish line, and so he'd be able to judge who the winners were. And if you remember back to our lesson a few weeks ago um, with Revelation 4, what was it that our Olympic winners would receive? receive a crown, a Stephanos, right? That was a winner's crown. And so uh, that would happen in the Olympic Games at the Bema Seat. And so at the Bema Seat of Christ, that's where we're going to be awarded our Stephanos. You'll get there if you know Jesus as your Savior. You'll hear, well done, good and faithful servants. And then you'll receive your Stephanos, your crowns, just like we talked about. Well, when we work all of that, we talked about Revelation 4, and if you remember, we had the 24 elders in Revelation 4 who were casting their crowns, their Stephanos at the foot of the throne. Well, we got to figure, if those guys were there in heaven, and they already had their crowns awarded, then the judgment seat of Christ must have taken place. And notice, this event with the crowns happened in Revelation 4 before the tribulation starts in Revelation 6. Timing, it's very clear, and it all uses the same imagery. And lastly, there's a very compelling argument of silence here. Think about how much of the New Testament is aimed at giving advice to the church. There's a lot of it, right? You got Jesus and who he is, there's uh, things that are going to happen, but then there's a ton of it in here that's advice uh, to church, to the church and uh, believers and everything that we face It talks about right responses, it talks about wrong responses, and so given that, given how much of the Bible is focused on helping the church get through what we have to get through, I find it kind of hard to imagine that if we, the church, were going to have to endure the tribulation, the absolute worst, most desperate and awful time in history, why then is there not a single shred of, of anything addressing the church during this time of suffering? 
There is not a single passage of encouragement to the church going through, uh, this church going through the tribulation. There is not a single verse that says, you, church age church, be strong during the tribulation. There is not a single passage of reassurance that we won't be harmed or that we're going to make it through the other side. There is no advice to us what to do during this time at all. And I cannot imagine that if God had purposed for us to endure the tribulation, that he would have failed to mention something to us about that in the Bible. It's not there, guys. It's not there. At least I haven't found anything like that. And the lack of nothing, uh, the lack of noting that the church, uh, uh, there's nothing about the church and the tribulation events that are already mentioned seems to me to really be consistent with the idea that we're going to be raptured out of here before the whole thing kicks off. So just to close out here, we've covered a lot of ground today, and this was a lot of very technical, fast information. I threw a lot of Bible verses at you, and if you're visiting with us today, I promise I don't normally do this, but here's why, here's why I wanted to go through all of this with you this morning. As a younger Christian, I didn't understand really much about the rapture. I knew what my church believed, I knew what our official doctrine was, and when Sierra and I were first married, we joined a church, and um, 15 years ago, we went through the membership process, and uh, we went through the, the doctrine they held about a pre-tribulation rapture, and I guess maybe it wasn't explained well, or just, I don't know, I didn't, didn't understand what they were saying, and so we walked out of there, and I remember talking with her about it and saying, you know, I'm not really convinced that that's a truth, that there is a rapture or that it is going to be at the beginning, but this is what our church believes, so I'm okay with that. And, you know, this is the, the position that feels the best, so uh, I'm going to go with that anyway because it's kind of wishful thinking, but there was no conviction at all on my part. But now, after many years and a lot of studying of this, and guys, we only touched the tip of the iceberg here this morning, but after really looking through this, to me, looking at these passages and some others, it is crystal clear. Right? This is just clear as day to me. And so I wanted to dive into the weeds a little bit here because I really want this to be crystal clear for you too. I don't, I don't think that everybody's going to be able to walk out of here ready to go debate a college professor about timing on any of this, you know, not, not expecting you to be able to reiterate all these passages because we didn't go into any depth here. I just hope that I was able to give you enough information so this idea of the pre-tribulation rapture can be more than just wishful thinking for you too. Right? I don't want this to be something that's so, so difficult or so complex that we just don't want to think about it. Because if we remember back to where we started with what Jude said, this promise of the rapture can give us hope. This promise of the rapture gives us something to look forward to. In this chaos and, and ridiculousness of a world that has gone absolutely crazy in the past few years, we're just doing our best to get by in the middle of all this. And as Jude said, we need to be building ourselves up in the faith, even when the world is assaulting and insulting our faith. We need to be praying in the Spirit, even when we're being assaulted with everything that's going on, and it makes, us hard, makes it hard for us to focus. We've got to be keeping ourselves in God's love we need to be living the life, right? we got to do all these things that Jude said. And of course, these are really hard things to do because this is not human nature at all. But listen, this is doubly hard now that our culture has turned against the church. Persevering in these ways is difficult. But remember, Jude also said, keep your eye on the prize. This is our motivation, right? Remember the promise of what's to come. That'll keep us going during these difficult times. The promise of the rapture, that is huge. That'll keep us motivated. Jude says, hold on to these things. There are few promises in the Bible better for this than the promise of the rapture. The promise that any minute now, without anything else needing to be done, Jesus will come back for us. He's going to come. We're going to meet him in the air. And we'll be able to go back with him and we'll be with him in eternity. And I'll close here. I think the final words of the book of Revelation express this longing better than I ever could. Revelation chapter 22, verses 21 says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Would you close with me in prayer?
Dear Lord, we thank you so very much for giving us this day. Thank you for letting us gather together to worship you as a a church body. And thank you that we're able to do this with people here uh, in this church building. Thank you so much that we're able to reach people remotely. And uh, it's just an amazing thing to serve you, Lord. And I just pray about the things that we've talked about this morning. We've gone through an awful lot here. And I just pray that anything we've talked about here that is true and an accurate interpretation, please give us wisdom from these things. And if I've erred in any way in what I have said, Lord, please make that apparent and have us exclude those things. But Father, the things that we did talk about that were right, give us wisdom, Lord, help us to become better sons and daughters to you as a result of these things. Lord, make your promises real to us, help keep them front of mind for us, that we may be able to look forward to Jesus' return and do a much better job with everything else between here and now, here and then, because we are so looking forward to the return of Christ that that is our primary motivation. We love you so, so very much, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.